The Q Continuum are perhaps the most powerful alien species in Trek. They can command near limitless control over all space, time, matter and energy, able to create and destroy life at will, change fundamental constants of the universe and create entire realities. The Continuum first appeared when Q put humanity on trial for our destructive nature in the first episode of The Next Generation Encounter at Farpoint. Aside from The Next Generation, The Continuum showed up in Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and recently in Star Trek Picard and Lower Decks, yet the true nature of the Continuum remains largely unknown. Throughout their many appearances in Trek, we've learned a lot of small details that may help us to better understand who the Q really are. And judging by that surprise appearance at the end of Picard Season 3, it would seem there is a lot more that we still have yet to discover. But for now, I'm Ellie with Trek Culture, here with 10 Secrets of the Q Continuum. Number 10. The Limitations of Their Powers while the Q may claim to be truly omnipotent and omniscient, or all-powerful and all-knowing, their powers actually do have some limitations. For starters, a Q may not go against the wishes of the Continuum. Q, Quinn, Q Jr and Amanda Rogers' parents have all been punished by the Continuum for going against their wishes. These punishments range from exile to being turned into a lower life form or even execution on rare occasions. Qs are also not truly all-knowing, as they have been surprised surprised on many occasions. Q was shocked to meet Guinan on the Enterprise D in Q Who, suggesting that he was unaware of her presence until that moment. As we'll also discuss later, the Q were also caught off guard by Quinn's rebellion and the revelation that they could die by natural causes. As far as we can tell, a Q at full power, with the support of the Continuum, can basically do or create anything. They possess full control over space, matter, time and energy. Yet, despite this, their intelligence and ability to or see the future definitely has limits. Number 9. They disappeared for at least 600 years The Continuum visited Earth many times before finally introducing themselves in Encounter at Farpoint. Quinn alone visited Isaac Newton in the 17th century, Will Riker's ancestor Thaddeus Riker in the 19th century, and a famous musician named Maury Ginsberg in the 20th century. After meeting Picard, Q became a regular nuisance in Starfleet. In the Discovery episode, the examples, set in 3190, the crew was discussing possible candidates for the creators of the DMA, and we learned that the Q Continuum had not made contact with Starfleet for 600 years, or since roughly 2590. Q's apparent death in Star Trek Picard Season 2 was in 2401, so this shows that other members of the Q Continuum continued to visit Earth after John Delancey's Q died, but decided to stop for some reason after the 26th century, perhaps waiting for humanity to cross some threshold, or simply manipulating human history and hiding, like they did before Q introduced himself to Picard. Number 8. Quinn the Philosopher The death of the Q, known as Quinn, was one of the most profound moments in the Continuum's history. Quinn was a respected philosopher among his people, before he was stripped of his powers and imprisoned inside a comet to prevent him from committing suicide. When the Voyager crew encountered him in the episode Death Wish, Quinn explained that life in the Continuum had become become painfully boring and pointless, as they have already seen and done everything imaginable. Q avoided his boredom by toying around with humans like Picard and Vash, but this didn't work for Quinn. He desired to end his own life to escape the monotony, but the Continuum would not allow him to, believing that the suicide of a Q would encourage others to do the same, causing untold social upheaval in the Continuum. With Voyager's help, Quinn was allowed to become mortal. He lost his powers and briefly served as a crewman on Voyager before deciding to go through with his suicide. Just as Q predicted, Quinn's death provoked a huge conflict in the continuum between advocates of personal freedom and the supporters of traditional Q culture. This bloody war caused the death of several more Qs, but it was eventually ended when Q and his partner decided to reproduce, creating the first new Q in over 10 millennia. Number 7. The New Era The origin of the Q is one of Star Trek's greatest mysteries. In The Q and the Grey, Q claimed that the continuum had always existed, but Quinn's comments in Death Wish show that there has at least been some evolution in their species. In Death Wish, Quinn explained that at the beginning of what he called the New Era, life 
before the queue was a constant dialogue of discovery, issues, and humor from all over the universe, before the continuum eventually stagnated, and having already seen everything and been everywhere, the queue began to lose their sense of purpose. This definitely shows that while the queue may have always existed, the structure of their society has been constantly evolving. Later, Quinn's death, the queue civil war, and the birth of Q Jr. caused even more changes in the continuum. We're left wondering what the queue were like before this so-called new era. Did they transition from typical physical bodies to beings of pure energy, or was this revolution merely a societal change? Number 6. Q Executions Given how opposed the continuum was to Quinn's suicide, you may be surprised to hear that they have actually executed their own people in the past. Long ago, two Qs became tired of life in the continuum, and chose to live as humans on Earth. They conceived a child that they named Amanda Rogers, and raised her as a human. But shortly after she was born, her parents were killed by the continuum with a tornado for continuing to use their powers. This suggests that leaving the continuum was not what caused their execution, but rather the use of their powers outside of the continuum's guidance. When Amanda grew up, she started to notice her powers, and in the Next Generation episode True Q, she was given a choice between losing these newfound Q abilities or joining the continuum. After realizing that holding back her powers would prove too difficult, she eventually chose to live as a Q and left her old life as a human behind. Number 5. Q Weapons In the Voyager episode The Q and the Grey, we saw a civil war breaking out in the continuum, caused by Quinn's death in the episode Death Wish. In that episode, the two Q factions fought each other with special weapons built by the continuum. These weapons, which were represented by guns from the American Civil War, were capable of injuring and killing Qs, and were so powerful that using them in the continuum could generate supernovae in our universe, a phenomenon that Q called Galactic Crossfire. These Q weapons are interesting because prior to this episode, it was assumed that all of the powers of the Q came from their own minds. Q weapons showed that the continuum could invent technology even more mighty than their natural powers, and these weapons could even be wielded by physical beings like humans. We already knew from episodes like True Q that the continuum was able to execute Qs, and there have been several times when Qs had their powers taken and were made mortal, but this was the first time humans were shown to be able to kill one of these highly powerful entities at full power. Number 4. The First Newborn in 10 Millennia The Q Civil War was caused by the suicide of one of their people, so Q hoped that he could end the conflict by creating a new life, something which he claimed had not been done in the continuum for over 10 millennia. Presumably since Amanda Rogers was born on Earth and raised as a human. He originally hoped to mate with Captain Janeway, a human, in order to combine the best parts of both their species, but when Janeway refused, he instead convinced his old partner, another Q, to conceive a child with him. Q and his partner discussed how to conceive a child, and decided to touch their fingers together, producing a little spark of light which apparently got the job done. The child, who became known as Q Jr., was meant to bring peace to the continuum, and usher in a new era, but he became more and more unruly as he approached adolescence, starting war, detonating Omega Molecules, and knocking planets out of their orbits. Q came to Voyager one last time in the episode Q2, in the hopes that Janeway would be able to straighten out the boy, who now appeared as a teenager because of how time works in the continuum. Q Jr. caused a lot of chaos on the ship, and eventually endangered Icheb's life. This devastated Jr., and he chose to sacrifice his own life to save his new friend, only for Q to reveal that he caused Icheb's injury in order to teach his son a lesson. Because of his offer to sacrifice himself, the Continuum chose not to turn the boy into an amoeba, as they originally planned, but instead into the next worst thing they could think of, a human. However, Junior's punishment was short-lived, as the Continuum soon came to the decision to allow him to keep his powers, under the strict and constant supervision of his father. Apparently, this sentencing must have been finished by Star Trek Picard Season 2, as we saw no mention of him after this episode. Number 3. Don't Provoke the Borg As we talked about earlier, Q's son, Q Jr., was brought to Voyager by his father in the episode Q2, in the hopes that Janeway would teach him to be more compassionate and careful with his powers. Unfortunately, he almost immediately started toying with the crew by harassing Seven, removing Neelix's mouth, and teleporting three Borg cubes in the ship's path. Not wanting to see Janeway and the others assimilated, Q returned to save them from his son's antics, and scolded him, saying, If the Continuum has told you once, they have told you a thousand times. Don't provoke the Borg. The way Q phrased his words here was interesting. One has to wonder why Q was so afraid of provoking the Borg, especially since he could change reality so easily 
and likely even destroy the whole collective with a single thought. Also, it was Q who first introduced Starfleet to the Borg in the Next Generation episode Q Who. Maybe he should take his own advice. Number 2. They aren't immortal after all. Or are they? When it was revealed that Q was dying in the second season of Star Trek Picard, Q seemed just as surprised as the fans were. As we mentioned earlier, members of the Continuum have always been able to kill each other, but no one knew they could also die by seemingly natural causes. They have always claimed to be immortal. The reason for Q's death was left unexplained. He stated that he was on the threshold of the unknowable and about to be enveloped in the warm glow of meaning. He began to slowly lose his powers and used his remaining energy to return Picard and the others to their own time period. Given how reluctant the Continuum was to allow Quinn to die, the revelation that Q's can die of purely natural causes must have had drastic implications for their society. Perhaps this was a new stage in their evolution, similar to the new era that Quinn describes. It's also likely that other members of the Continuum may have started to die off after Q, which could explain why they stopped visiting Starfleet after the 26th century. Of course, they could repopulate by creating a new generation, much in the same way that Q Jr. was created, but this would still cause severe changes in their society. Another possible explanation is that the Continuum was killing Q as punishment for his rebellious behaviour. Q rebelled against his species on several occasions. Once they punished him by turning him into a human, so killing him doesn't seem that unlikely. Now of course Q's arrival to Jack at the end of Picard Season 3 suggests that perhaps they are immortal after all. But he also suggests that humans need to think less linearly, and perhaps this is a version of Q who comes before the events of Picard Season 2. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Number 1. The Alorian Summoning Ritual The Continuum have always had a very mysterious relationship with Guinan's species, the Elorians. When Q encountered Guinan in the Next Generation episode Q Who, the two of them posed defensively, and Q seemed legitimately scared of her. It wasn't until the second season of Picard that we finally learned more about their relationship. In the episode Monsters, Guinan explained that the Elorians and the Q Continuum were engaged in a cold war long ago, before the two sides struck a truce. Part of this truce was that the Elorians were granted the ability to summon a member of the Continuum at any time through a ritual that required a liquid to be poured into a special bottle. The ritual initially failed, to Guinan's surprise, but she and Picard later encountered Q in the next episode. Apparently, the summoning was simply delayed because of Q's diminishing powers. We still don't know many details about this Cold War Guinan mentioned, or how the Elorians could have possibly stood against the godlike powers of the Continuum. Elorians are highly powerful beings, able to control the rate of their own ageing and feel changes to the timeline, but they haven't mastered space and time to the same level that the Q have. Hopefully we learn one day how the Elorians were able to threaten the Continuum, yet were devastated by the Borg. And that concludes our list. Let us know your thoughts on the Q Continuum in the comments down below, and while you're there don't forget to like and subscribe and tap that notification bell so you never miss a Trek Culture video ever again. Also head over to Twitter and Instagram to follow us there, and I can be found across various social medias just by searching Ellie Little Child. I've been Ellie with Trek Culture. I hope you have a wonderful day and remember to boldly go where no one has gone before.